So uh, today we will have a special lecture. Uh, will present by Dr. Krisigar uh, related to drug delivery system. So this uh, lecture will be guided by the moderator, uh, Professor Melva. Uh, Melva, time is yours. Thank you, Professor Roy Muli. So dear students and staff from Master Student of Biomedical Sciences, I am delighted to have you join me today in this webinar. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Melva Luisa from the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. I will be hosting and moderating uh, today's session. First, I would like to introduce to our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Nilimak Sirsagar, MBBS, MD, DNB, and PhD in clinical pharmacology. She is a member of the Global Health Clinical Division of the International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacologists, IUFAR, and also a member of a WHO Product Development Advisory Committee of the Safety of Medical Products. And she is also the chairperson for the core training panel or pharmacovigilance program for the government of India. She has published for over uh, 280 papers in many prestigious journals such as Lancet Global, uh, Lancet Global Health, Lancet Infectious Disease, British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, and uh, many more. Her talk today will cover the topics of drug delivery system uh, experience in developing from uh, bench to bedside. So uh, the floor, uh, the screen is yours, Dr. Nilma. Please, uh, ask the talk today. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Wawai Muli and Malvia yourself and others for inviting me to uh, share uh, my experience in developing a drug delivery system from the bench to uh, bedside. It's a great privilege to be able to talk to the students. And uh, I do hope that uh, from uh, my experience, uh, they will uh, get some insight into drug development and uh, will be able to apply that uh, for their own uh, work. So most of the students here uh, because they are in master, uh, they would be knowing about the several drug delivery systems for different therapeutic purposes that are there, such as the red blood cell membrane. Then we have hyaluronic acid-based drug nanocarrier and the polymer lipid hybrid nanoparticle, the hexagonal boron nitride sheets the targeted drug delivery, the microelectromechanical system, the in to gel, and the self-microemulsifying products. So there are several review articles on which uh, you can get information on this. So what I'm going to do today is to speak on our own experience in developing a liposomal drug delivery system. As most of you would know, a uh, liposome consists of this kind of uh, bilayer lipid structure with a core inside mostly uh, water and or uh, maybe saline or dextrose. And uh, so water-soluble drugs uh, can be inside the water compartment and the lipid-soluble can be in the lipid compartment. Outside this, uh, you may have some antibodies attached to target uh, and maybe uh, this kind of a polyethylene glycol layer so that the drug uh, is not uh, actually taken up by the macrophages. The drug delivery system I'm going to talk about is the liposomal drug delivery system. So this is the liposomal uh, drug delivery system product that we produced in our own laboratory. So I'm going to tell you the story of how we develop this drug uh, forward to take it to marketplace and then be used in patients. This is what the bottle, nice swanky looking, smart looking bottle after the pharma company took over the marketing rights from us and they developed the, our uh, homegrown product which looks something like this to a marketed product which looked very smart. But as you can see, our name developed by our hospital is etched on that uh, bottle. 
So this is where the work was done. This is the St. G.S. Medical College and KEM Hospital, where I studied and also was the professor head there. And this is located in Mumbai in India. And this was the Department of Clinical Pharmacology under the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai. And we did this work at the Liposomal Clinical Pharmacology Center, which was funded by the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. So the product Indian Liposomal Amphotericin, and when marketed, its brand name is Fungizome. This was developed by us in collaboration with Delhi University with funding from biotechnology, as I mentioned, the technology transfer was done to a company and through a national research development corporation. All of our work started in collaboration with Dr. Bachawat, who is on the left-hand side here, who was collaborating with Dr. Gregorius, Gregoriadis from London, UK, who is both of them are well-known experts in liposomal drug delivery systems. We had a large number of people who worked with us, uh, many clinicians and many people worked with us. But I must mention especially the names of some of these. And as you can see, there are students of Master in Pharmacy, PhD, Clinical Pharmacology. So this should inspire all of you to take up this kind of research because they are all a student just like you. So what Dr. Bachawat's group had done was that they had developed a liposomal amphotericin, as I will show in the next slide, its constituent. And what they showed was that, as you can see here, compared to plain amphotericin, which has a toxicity or LD50, that means even at a small dose of one milligram per kg body weight of the mouse, 50% of the animals were dead. And in the aspergillus mouse model, the effect was only 13%, only one-tenth of the animals survived. But when the same amphotericin was entrapped in the liposome and small unilamellar vesicle, its toxicity was considerably reduced. So even at more than 10 milligram per kg, uh, the animals were surviving. Similarly, in the Aspergius mouse model, 70% of the animals survived. They also showed the pharmacokinetics in the infected animals that the distribution, the plain amphotericin was mainly distributed to kidney, while the liposomal amphotericin was mainly distributed to the lungs. So that excited us quite a lot because amphotericin is used in systemic fungal infection. And around that time, there was a considerable increase in the systemic fungal infection because patients were suffering from HIV AIDS, uh, they were receiving cancer chemotherapy, organ transplant, diabetes, premature infant, they were all susceptible to systemic fungal infections. The one drug which was very effective was amphotericin. But the problem with amphotericin was that it had to be given over four to six hours intravenously the patient would suffer from severe fever and rigor. And it also caused kidney toxicity. So much so that people used to call it as amphoterrible instead of amphotericin. Bachavat and his co-workers from Delhi University showed that this liposomal amphotericin, they used a so soya phosphatidylcholine, that is SPC, or egg phosphatidylcholine plus cholesterol. So it had this enhanced efficacy and reduced toxicity. And it had this promise of also being low cost. Now this liposomal amphotericin is prepared by using the rotary evaporator, as some of you would know, to make multilamellar liposomal vesicle. So when this rotary evaporator contains is... Uh, uh, amphotericin dissolved in methanol and is put in this uh, and then reconstituted, it prepares the multilamellar liposomal vesicles. Now, the problem was when we had to take this to patients was initially, especially, there was a high cost of the sigma lipid, the soya phosphatidylcholine, 
that's what they had made their liposomal amphotericin from. Now, it was all okay for them because their mouse used to weigh 10, 20, 30 gram. So, for a 30 gram mouse, that cost didn't matter. But then when we had to convert it to 50 kilogram human, that cost was getting a bit too much. But luckily for us, by then the pharmaceutical grade low cost became available. But then the other problem was that these liposomes were not patient worthy. For one, there was an entrapment of 90%. So that it needed dialysis to remove the unbound drug. The second thing was that they sonicated this multilamellar vesicle to convert them into small unilamellar vesicle for which they used a probe sonicator, which dipped into the solution to sonicate and get the unilamellar vesicle. But then that made it non-sterile. Also, we found that the unilamellar liposomes are not stable. So you can't market unilamellar liposome. So here is the data. Look, plain amphotericin, as I showed before, the LD50 was one or so, and the freshly the plain amphotericin was survival only 10% in uh, the uh, mouse model. After 30 days also, it was still 70%. Multilamellar vesicle converted to small unilamellar vesicle with sonication. LD50 to begin with was fine, 17 milligram, that's great. The efficacy freshly made was very good, 75% survival. But then if you store it for 30 days as small unilamellar vesicle, then the efficacy decreased to 56%. Now that's no good for patient because you know you can't sonicate with probe, then the product will become unsterile. You can't dialyze because then they'll become unsterile. And uh, then the efficacy stability was also no good. So we've sort of optimized the entire procedure so that the multilamellar vesicle, the percent entrapment increased substantially to 95-96%. And the multilamellar vesicle we converted to small unilamellar vesicle just before injection of the unopened bottle. So our idea was that market the multilamellar vesicle and convert it into small unilamellar vesicle with a bath sonicator. So you don't have to open the bottle and the bottle therefore remains sterile. So what we see here, that it's uh, LD50 is high, good, and uh, freshly prepared 75%, after 30 days, 30%, 70%. So here we then had a product which was good. So we had this small manufacturing sterile pyrogen free preparation then. And then we carried out the phase one for safety, phase two for safety efficacy study, phase three clinical trial for comparing it with the plain amphotericin. So for phase one tolerability study and pharmacokinetic, uh, we started with 0.1 milligram, little small dose, 0.4 and one milligram per kg, which we injected in 12 patients. And to assess the acute effect of the liposomal preparation is tolerated or not and its effect on biochemistry and plasma levels. So here was our first patient. You can see that the first patient was injected nearly 20 years back. Now this patient, we gave our liposomal amphotericin, which we had manufactured in our own uh, institution in of course a sterile uh, room setup made there. Now when we injected this patient, we put the patient in the intensive care unit because in case there is any sudden reaction, we should be able to manage it. So we had these five, six doctors standing around, myself and uh, my student, and we were all standing around and we gave this patient a liposomal amphotericin. After a few minutes of injection, the patient complained of chest pain. You can imagine how scared we must have got. So we immediately stopped the injection, took the ECG. So there was nothing wrong with the ECG at all. So after waiting for some time, we continued with the injection. Patient was not comfortable, but we finished the injection. Then the next day, then two days later, the next dose had to be given. 
So there was no place now in the intensive care unit. So we shifted the patient from the intensive care unit to the step down unit. Now the doctors were busy with the intensive care. So we had only one doctor and two of us standing there. Now the patient had no chest pain or anything whatsoever. So we really realized that his chest pain was probably because of the intensive care unit set up and so many doctors standing by his side. So he was less worried, less concerned. So it was not the drug, but the environment which had probably caused the chest pain. So we successfully then gave him the injection and all the others. And uh, we also uh, took the blood sample and did this plasma concentration with HPLC method. And uh, these are the individual patient's data also. And what we found is that there were some main, main advantages with the liposomal amphotericin. As I mentioned earlier, plain amphotericin injection has to be given very slowly because otherwise it causes severe fever rigor and that is probably on account of the DMSO contained in it. But you can give the liposomal amphotericin quite quickly over just one hour period and in a busy hospital setup, this is a very big advantage. Fever rigor, nearly 75% of the patient get it, even with a pre-treatment of antihistaminic and steroid, while liposomal amphotericin, very few patients get, and it's not severe at all. And biochemical abnormalities also, very few patients get, as can be seen in the next uh, subsequent slide, which I'll show in detail. So then we went on to looking for the efficacy. So this is the phase two study. So we had patients with all sorts of systemic fungal infection, candida, candiduria, candidiasis, oral candidiasis, cryptococcal meningitis, aspergillus, mucormycosis, cladiosporosis. We had 77 patients, but only 50 were evaluable because many were quite serious and uh, they were, didn't survive even for assessment. So we had to uh, not consider these as accessible. So out of the 50 accessible patients, we got complete response in a large number. A few were partial response and some didn't respond. Uh, if you can see there that the fever and chills were not at all that much and uh, very tolerable. And a few patients did get hypocalcemia. And in neonate, because the blood samples were being drawn, they did get a fall in the PCV. Now we wanted to go to phase three. So we expanded our manufacturing facility, which the government provided us the funding to do that. And we had this relatively large stage in manufacture. And remember that these are sterile pyrogen free preparation. So they were still our homegrown ones. So they still our bottle look very uh, simple ones. But uh, we had to make sure that there is a good quality control for our liposomal amphotericin. So we set the limits uh, for amphotericin content, the phosphatidylcholine content, the lipid drug ratio. Methanol had to be evaporated completely, so less than 1000 ppm. It has to pass the sterility test, the pyrogen test. It should have the minimal, minimum lethal dose more than 10 and the percent entrapment, entrapment more than 90%. We also check the particle size. So the multilamellar vesicle had this particle size of, as you can see, about uh, three or four. And when sonicated, they became this small unilamellar vesicle. We also wanted to check for the stability now. So we look for the percent entrapment and the minimum lethal dose. And on the lab scale we had checked and the pilot scale or the larger scale that we did, did that. And you can see that the percent entrapment in the beginning and one year later was the same as also the uh, lethal dose. So we were quite sure now that uh, this preparation which we had made uh, with storage at four degree had good stability and uh, good safety uh, till one year later on it was shown to be more than two years old. And we injected in large number of patients. Now, here is the data on the phase three. Phase three uh, A, and then we had injected it also in those who had not responded to plain amphotericin and uh, also those who had not responded to 
uh, fluconazole, so a little bit of data in there later. So this is a liposomal amphotericin, and this is fungisome or the brand name for the plain amphotericin. So you can see that under the liposomal amphotericin, in fact, in this, we had out of 20, 17 were assessable, and all had shown complete response. There's a good response here. On the other hand, with the plain amphotericin, uh, 17 assessable, 14 showed response, and three had to be transferred to the liposomal amphotericin, either because they showed too much of toxicity with plain amphotericin, or they were not responding. So two patient, one patient had shown toxicity, and when there is uh, given liposomal amphotericin, showed complete response. One patient had not responded, but uh, he succumbed too quickly. Another one showed toxicity, but he didn't respond to the liposomal also. And then these were the patients who were not tolerating uh, plain amphotericin. They were enrolled also. And as you can see that uh, uh, if they had suffered uh, side effects, and then liposomal amphotericin, they could complete and get complete response. Similarly, in this case also, and this case also. But if they had no response, then the, maybe it was too late and they didn't respond. Similarly, for fluconazole also, if they were not responding to fluconazole, they showed complete response here. The interesting thing here is this slide. With plain amphotericin, patient showed a marked rise in creatinine. When we stopped amphotericin, the creatinine dropped. But if we started amphotericin, again, it started to rise. So such a patient, when given liposomal amphotericin, he had sustained uh, levels of creatinine, which were in normal range. So these uh, two, three slides show the data on the uh, infusion-related side effect and so on. So these are summarized here. So you can see that fever with chills and rigors much higher with plain amphotericin compared to the liposomal. Hypokalemia, which is also and uh, which is a uh, indicator also of the toxicity, much higher in amphotericin and somewhat lower with the liposomal amphotericin. Similarly, nephrotoxicity as seen by rise in creatinine. Also, plain amphotericin. You can see how many patients got it and compared to the other liposomal amphotericin. So we had been able to now give this drug quite safely to children. Uh, you see these slides are quite old uh, because uh, this is long time back story. So then we could give it to the children also to newborn babies and uh, quite safely. In fact, we got so confident about the drug that we gave it in the patient home also. She didn't want to come to the hospital we could give it to the patient in her house also. Of course, there was a, a nurse standby in case any reaction happened. Uh, there is another disease for which uh, amphotericin is used, and that is called visceral leishmaniasis. <coughs> so this is uh, also called as Kalada. It doesn't occur in Indonesia, but it occurs in uh, India and Africa and South America, it's really a disease of the poorest of poor patient. It's life threatening patient will die if not given treatment. And it manifests as initially anemia, liver and spleen is enlarged and then uh, uh, the, the it is caused by the bite of the sand the vector that is sand fly. And they also have post calada dermal leishmaniasis, which is the skin lesion because of which the transmission occurs. Here also, there are a number of drugs, but uh, they are too toxic or too long in duration. So in these patients, uh, liposomal amphotericin is effective. Uh, we did a dose searching study, and you can see 2 mg per kg for 10 days, which is a much shorter than the plain amphotericin regime. We got 100% efficacy. Uh, also, we administered this to those patients who were antimony, that is the standard drug resistance, and they responded also. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, also with um, uh, those who were resistant to even plain amphotericin, they responded to. So these are slides which say pentamidine, another drug given, but not no response, and they responded there. So the question is, why does liposomal amphotericin, why is it safe and more effective? So its explanation can be seen in the pharmacokinetics. 
So plain amphotericin gets distributed quite a lot in kidney and uh, that's how you get its nephrotoxicity. On the other hand, liposomal amphotericin gets uh, in lungs, which is the site of infection for a lot of fungal infection. So why does that happen? It's postulated that when it is injected intravenously, it gets taken up by the macrophages in the blood, uh, which gets more distributed to the site of infection. And uh, that is how you get more concentration of liposomal amphotericin at the site of infection. And uh, so you get better efficacy and lesser toxicity. Okay, so uh, with all that work, we got patent on the liposomal amphotericin. So hooray, we all rejoiced on that. And uh, then, of course, uh, we had the technology transfer. Uh, we transferred the uh, technology uh, to the pharma company. Because obviously, we can't uh, market the product being from a hospital setup. So they took over. You can see me here. And you can, I think I look much younger because it was a long time ago. Now, this is another. And this is what the marketed product looks like. And it's all uh, wonderful boxes and all but then we were not happy we were not entirely happy because we wanted to make sure that the product which the company is marketing is the same quality as we are preparing that there are no extra additional adverse drug reactions what the economics of it really can people really you know how is it going then we also thought we should do some more clinical trials after marketing so as to expand its use, maybe optimize the dose. So we wanted to check on the quality. So the marketed product we picked up from the market and we tested it. Sonicated sample, unsonicated sample, our product and the post-marketing surveillance product. And uh, you can see that the marketed unsonicated MLB was comparable to what we had pre-marketing as also the unilamellar vesicle, sometimes a bit off, but uh, they corrected that. Then similarly, the LD50, which was very important. Uh, in fact, they had also improvised on the product. And uh, the pro so the compared to the plain amphotericin, it was a, a very good uh, safety that they got. So these were many of the cities where it was marketed. And um, these, you see, the cities are quite all over in India. You can see all over. So we collected the data for efficacy. And uh, you can see that in compared to a plain amphotericin data, which we have from our phase three, and these are our phase uh, two and three data. This is the phase four post-marketing. So as you can see, it is a bit less than, uh, but that's because of the number of patient and the type of patient, etc but uh, they are still excellent in efficacy. And as you can see, the safety, which are the main concern compared to plain amphotericin, the safety is uh, excellent in the phase four study also, that is the post-marketing study also. And now if you will recollect those of you who are a little familiar with the amphotericin, uh, there are other products in the market out of which ambisome is really liposome. Apple set and amphocil, these are not liposome. They are ribbon-like or disc-like. They all have different sizes. The dose used importantly, and I need to remember that their dose is quite high, 5 milligram per kg. Ours is 1 to 2 milligram per kg. And these are, of course, all the pharmacokinetic data here. So if you look at the cost, then what happens is, of course, plain amphotericin, needless to say, is very, very less expensive. But then when you compare to the total cost of treatment for four weeks by all the other, because uh, when in market, you have to see the comparator or your competitor, so to say. So you can see that the liposomal amphotericin which we had made, uh, cost per day is also quite low. And the total treatment cost compared to the other product is uh, really one-fifth or one-tenth of it even. Then we did further phase four studies, uh, multicentric open comparative randomized study to compare one milligram versus three milligram. And we did that in cryptococcal meningitis in patient with AIDS. Uh, because in our phase three studies, cryptococcal meningitis, we had given one milligram per kg dose. 
and the all patient recovered but then we wanted to see if we can shorten the total duration of treatment and more than that how quickly the patient get well so we increased the dose to 3 mg per kg to see so there was some improvement in the duration in which they respond but then the total cost of treatment was going too high so we still recommend 1 mg per kg dose there the other study we did was in patient with empirical treatment of febrile neutropenia comparing with liposomal amphotericin with plain amphotericin and uh, this study we showed that it is very much safer and uh, comparable to amphotericin and efficacy and this was the study design and these papers were published and uh, i'm showing you a photograph of one of my students who did this work and uh, he is now in usa of course we also afterward post marketing did the study uh, in post the dermal lishman assays and you can see that uh, uh, pre treatment uh, these were the and these are important they don't uh, bother the patient that much but from public health point of view they are important because this is the place from which the sand fly would pick up the organism or the parasite and will spread it around so post treatment uh, you can see the difference and the good response that we've seen. We were also concerned about access to antifungal to resource poor countries and uh, we wrote up to the Lancet infectious diseases how this is very important and it's not a, then a question of uh, uh, you know generic or whatever that this one was actually not uh, just a generic of the uh, amphotericin am ambisome but it was a completely different product in itself. So you see, it takes a long, long time for a drug to be developed. Dr. Bachavath has started his work in 85. We started, as you saw, from 91. 91 to 96, we did all these clinical trials. But even then, the transfer and marketing still brought it to 2003. Of course, we got accolades and felicitations and all that. But more importantly, we were happy that it helped the patient. So 2003 marketing. And then in 2020, 21, uh, it, it was marketed and in, in the market and its use became even more prominent in COVID-19. You may remember that some patient developed mucormycosis and that happened because of excessive use of corticosteroid and broad spectrum antibiotics and happened more so in comorbid diabetic patient and a high mortality. And the liposomal amphotericin became very handy uh, to treat these patients of uh, mucormycosis also. So I would like to just end up with a very uh, uh, quote from our former president, APJ Abdul Kalam, and uh, his five capabilities in the learning process. And I always like to uh, tell my students what he said. So, you know, you should have a disciplinary mind, which is mastery over one discipline, like you are doing now maybe in pharmacology. And then you should have a synthesizing mind that you should know other different disciplines also and be able to integrate ideas from different disciplines. Uh, we were helped by other disciplines like biochemistry with Dr. Bachavat and we could integrate that to create our liposomal amphotericin. Of course, you need to have a creative mind and solutions a step ahead of the computer. We have too much of computer today, but a creative mind definitely can... Uh, go beyond chat GPT or whatever. But all this is not important if you don't have a respectful mind. That is a mind which appreciates the difference between humans. And also an ethical mind, work with integrity beyond self-interest. And uh, this is the message I would like to end up my talk with. And thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation, Dr. Nilima. It's very uh, um, astonishing what you did uh, with the uh, amphotericin, um, liposomal amphotericin. And it's from the 90s and then it uh, still be uh, being used on the COVID-19, right? Yeah, mucormycosis. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. And now I invite um, the students and uh, the staff if there is uh, questions. Uh, you can raise your hand or maybe um, uh, put your uh, questions on the chat room. 
maybe I can start, Dr. Nilima. I want to ask yes, uh, sure. yeah, while you were uh, doing all of the uh, preclinical and uh, clinical studies of um um uh and then uh, afterward you do the technic, uh, technology transfer to pharma, right? Is there any yeah. uh, additional trials that is done by the pharma before they are marketing the uh, liposomal antipotericin? Yes. So they uh, they did uh, they did do some further studies in uh, leishmaniasis uh, Kalajar patient, as you saw. Uh, that our main focus was on fungal infection. We did do some phase two study. Uh, so they did work on that uh, group of patients and uh, showed uh, uh, that uh, uh, the dose and the duration on which it is effective and also did some more in vitro study. But largely the, you're right, largely the uh, product uh, um, booklet that they have depend is dependent on all the work which we have done okay yeah so um, it means that uh, most of the clinical trials were done by the uh, uh, uh by by the university right yeah okay. yeah so we did that uh, we were yeah sorry so we were uh, we were funded totally by the department of biotechnology so we could do all that work uh, uh, though they took some time to <laughs> release the funds and so on, the usual issues, but we could do the study because of their uh, financial assistance. Yeah. Yeah, and then production, Dr. Nilma, um, the production of, is there any difference between the homegrown uh, liposomal amphotericin and with the one that is uh, produced by the pharma company? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you you saw that I did show a slide. We were also very apprehensive whether they will make it as well as we did. Of course, in the technology transfer, we gave to them the complete know-how as to how to make it, you know, the quantity, how to the rotation speed and the volume, everything, everything. So uh, they, and we picked up samples from the market, what they had already started marketing. And we tested that for the particle size and the constituents of it and so on. So uh, they were uh, the same quality as what we had homegrown product <laughs> as we used. Yes. Yeah. So there's no problem in uh, in uh, the transfer of... Uh, because sometimes yeah. in our, our uh, university, sometimes when we do a transfer uh, uh, technology to pharma, uh, they don't want to use the one that is used by the university. Sometimes in the university, we use the high grade uh, um, ingredients, right? <laughs> so it okay. will become uh, very uh, expensive if they market it. Yeah. But then uh, mm. you uh, you have also, uh, also shown that it's uh, regarding the pharmacoeconomy. It's also um, uh not not that uh not that high the price of your yeah. uh product yeah you're right because that is one care that uh, when you are developing it in academic center you need to take that into account so that uh, normally you know as uh, researchers uh, we don't uh, normally look very carefully to the cost of the thing uh, so uh, so that becomes a problem so right from when you start developing the product uh, one at one, uh, some stage, you know that this product is working. So before the technology transfer, you should uh, be able to like we use the uh, pharmaceutical grade lipids, which were much much less costly compared to the sigma lipids. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, so yeah. our technology was transferred with uh, the pharma grade uh, pharmaceutical grade product itself, which were low cost, and uh, so the same could be used by the company. And the pharmaceutical grade uh, product themselves have uh, their own very strict quality standards. So the ingredients have strict quality standards and then the final product should have strict quality standards. Then you can be uh, more sure about the safety, efficacy and quality of the product. That, that care uh, is absolutely essential. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's very important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have uh, Professor Wawai Muli, please. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Melva. So very interesting lecture, uh, Dr. Milima. So uh, I think my question is uh, out of the topic. But uh, I mean, uh, we are very, very uh, wondering yeah, why uh, India India can produce a raw material very cheap. So uh, because of uh, in our pharmacy company, they always imported raw material from India because of the issue is the in uh, the India pro, uh, the India can uh, produce very low cost raw material for uh, for drug. So for example, like uh, even though like acetaminophen or uh, some antibiotic, so we import the raw material from India and then we we make uh, drug yeah. I mean, patent drug in Indonesia. So, could you tell me why it is uh, it will uh, it can be happen in India? It is so. That's why uh, in our country, uh, I mean, uh, very less uh, company uh, produce the raw material, uh, something like that. So, could you tell me about uh, that uh, issue? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not an expert on that topic, but uh, what I uh, know from general discussions and uh, meetings and so on. So there are two things. One is that uh, we have over the past, uh, you know, uh, many decades, we have developed the uh, chemistry departments a lot in the country. So there are national chemical laboratories and, uh, you know, drug research institutions, which all uh, in the 70s, they all uh, went into finding out different ways of manufacturing drugs. Now, that, it was the time when there was a lot of patent laws. But uh, in India, uh, what the government said is that uh, instead of product patent, we will have process patent. Of course, that law is now changed considering the WTO and you know we have to agree now to the global uh, rules. So that led to a large amount of academic input to manufacturing processes. So for many drugs like ibuprofen, acetaminophen that you mentioned, uh, the uh, simple methods of manufacturing, sometimes even better than the originator. Like, you know, product developed by GSK or something, the Indian Redis would develop it, uh, you know, the process for manufacturing would be simpler. And therefore the simpler process would cost much less than even the, uh, you know, even the originator. Uh, now, of course, you know, we have to have an agreement with the originator. The other thing that happens in India because of the big market, you know, large bulk amount is prepared. So for an industry to be able to survive or be able to make profit, uh, there is a certain balance between how much quantity you make. The larger the quantity you make, you know, the easier it is to uh, make it more cost effective. So these two things together makes uh, the active pharma ingredient as they call. But even then, you know, you said this, but even then for quite some time, we were importing from China. And uh, then there were lots of issues and uh, sometimes there would be issues of quality. So then it was realized that, all you know, you can't uh, just think of a, you know, less expensive product if it is not of good enough quality. So that is how. But I think in a global scenario now, uh, every country has to be dependent on the other country for something or the other. So if your country should see what your strengths are. And, uh, you know, overall, the, if the overall cost of the product is going to be low for your country, uh, then it's okay to import from India, say. But if you find that uh, you do have enough uh, chemistry expertise in the country, then some of the basic drugs they can develop in your own country. So it's a, you know, it's a very big policy decision which is taken at a government level. Uh, and the government support is very necessary here because private companies on their own, unless they are given land free or electricity at low cost or some such benefits are given to them, uh, then they can actually get into manufacturing the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nilima. Okay. 
Thank you, Prof. Uh, Waimuli. Is there any students that want to ask? Is it okay? It is okay for you to ask in Bahasa. I will translate for Dr. Nilima. <laughs> is I think there is a metric uh, from chat. Okay. Chat. Uh, chat. Okay, from... Yeah, let me... Um, let me read from Andika Yusuf Ramadan, uh, the student from uh, pharmacology. Good afternoon, Dr. Nilime. I found that a lot of antifungal therapy has a little availability in the uh, cerebrovascular fluid yeah, due to their molecular properties to crossing the blood-brain barrier. For this liposomal amphotericin, is there any evidence? Um, that the liposomal amphotericin has better availability in the CSF? Or is it just for clinical yes. efficacy studies? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, we, did, uh, we did do some uh, studies in the patients, and but largely in animal studies. Hmm? Mm. Uh, we had, a, uh, I didn't show that data because I thought it will be quite a lot. Uh, the basis for our 1 milligram per 3 milligram, 2 3 milligram per kg dose in cryptococcal meningitis patient was uh, we developed an animal model of cryptococcal meningitis and compared plain amphotericin with liposomal amphotericin. And in animals, we did the blood, uh, the brain levels and the CSF level. So that's where we showed that the liposomal amphotericin can uh, transfer to the brain and into the CSF. So that data and that gave us that with instead of one milligram, three milligram had a better effect. So that's why we had, so we also did the study uh, in uh, um, prophylactically, whether it given prophylactically it helps. So these are all animal studies. In humans, it is a bit uh, more difficult to take patient CSF and do the CSF level. Besides what happens is it's not just the CSF level. Uh, so for the drug to act, you know, it has to act on the meninges. So it is the brain, blood brain barrier, brain uh, levels and the meningeal levels. So CSF level is like a what is coming out into the CSF. Also in urine, you know, it's a very bit complicated. Your question is a very valid one, slightly more complicated because we use it in... Uh, um, you know, uh, candidiasis and infection in the kidney. But you find very little comes out in the urine. But that's because it gets concentrated in the tissue itself. Being lipid soluble, it remains in the tissue. And uh, CSA for urine being more, containing more of aqueous water fluid, uh, doesn't come in high enough concentration. But uh, it is present in the brain matrix and uh, outside the blood vessels, okay? So it is the tissue concentration will become important rather than the fluid concentration. Yeah. But we have we have done studies in uh, human also, but more so in animal because human, it is a bit difficult ethically, not always uh, patient don't give permissions and so on. Yeah, and yeah. then maybe the, the case is uh, small, right, uh, Dr. Nilma? The oh, fungal, fungal men meningitis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So fungal meningitis, cryptococcal uh, meningitis, it is very effective. So sometimes, you know, uh, its efficacy is an indicator that enough drug is going into the required uh, infection sites. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question, uh, Andika. Yes, Andika. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we can, yeah. Andika wants to give uh, comments. Uh, I think it's already explained enough. Uh, thank you, Prof. Neva and Dr. Nilima. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to continue with the question from uh, Andi Gunawan, one of our students. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Nilima. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Andi, student of pharmacology, uh, he wants to ask, is there any special packaging for liposomal amphotericin to make them still stable for a long time? Does the packaging product should uh, or could influence the cost of the product. Yeah. Okay. No, the, the packaging uh, is a system. It has a thermocline uh, bottle. So the the bottle itself is the you know the usual uh, quality of glass which is required for 
uh, storing intravenous fluids. The important thing for the bottle itself was because the bottle was going to be dipped in the water bath to sonicate it. So if you might have seen that the bottle itself had the name and everything, everything etched on it, etched on it. So not the usual uh, paper uh, thing wrapped around it because that would come off when put in a uh, water bath. So that was for the bottle itself. And you saw that around it was this thermocol box because it has to be stored at four degree temperature. So that was the packaging which was uh, made so that uh, you know it can be maintained in the proper temperature of four degrees. So that's, uh, yes, it did. And actually the company did a good job. I think they even got some award for their packaging. I hope that was, uh, that answered your question, I hope. Yeah. I, yeah, uh, Andy, I think, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the question has been answered. And then one of our staff, Dr. Rani Wardani Hakim, uh, asked, how did you do the upscaling product, uh, the lab equipment the, uh, that you use uh, in lab grade that is actually different from the pharma? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. So, yes. So we, we bought the, you know, we had the smaller one, which was the original one, uh, which was uh, enough for our phase one study. And the uh, larger scale manufacturer, we bought the full equipment, I mean, the full larger scale equipment. Uh, and uh, the room was enough, the room size was enough. And as you might have seen, after the production, there itself it has to be uh, bottled uh, because uh, you can't uh, irradiate or any other way or heat or boil it to sterilize it. So the manufacturing has to be under sterile condition and the bottling also has to be under sterile condition. It's a very uh, you know, important thing in the process itself because afterwards liposome can't be eradicated or boiled, sterilize it afterwards. So the manufacturing process itself should be pyrogen free and uh, sterile. So we had to every time keep checking that the every batch we produce is sterile pyrogen free. So we bought the we bought the whole equipment again, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> not to be means I didn't spend my money. The government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you have also uh, have shown the the photo of the lab. Uh, that yeah, produced. yeah, from the, the yeah. small one to the larger scale manufacturer. Yeah. yeah, but it was still okay enough for, you know, clinical trial. We had to transfer the technology to make it, uh, to give it to the industry to manufacture. Yeah, but still a lot of money for the grant, right, uh, Dr. Lili Maso? Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you very yes. much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that answers your question, uh, Dr. Rani. Is there any questions? Any more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Cherry. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, izin bertanya. Mohon maaf. Uh, saya menggunakan bahasa. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Nilima. Um, uh, saya izin bertanya mengenai uh, uh, amputerisin liposom ini. Um, bagaimana uh, amputerisin yang liposomal uh, ini dapat menuju ke paru-paru gitu. Oke, okay. okay. thank you, Dr. Cherry. Uh, Dr. Cherry is one of our student. She asked uh, how the um, lip liposomal amphotericin can can go mostly to the lung, and then um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I showed that slide. Now this is uh, you know we haven't done the study. There are some studies done by others. But it is postulated that what happens is because they are there because of their size and being, you know, into quote, being foreign to the body, the circulating macrophages uh, engulf them. And at the site of infection, the capillaries are dilated. So the macrophages go out uh, from the dilated capillary. That is how you get the concentration at the site of infection. So in the mouse model, that was an aspergillus mouse model, which was the lung infection. So that is how it was concentrated in the lung. When we did the cryptococcal meningitis model, because the infection is in the meninges, 
So there the capillaries would be dilated. So you'll get higher concentration there at the site of infection. Uh, and because they're liposomal, so they won't attach to the uh, kidney where, <laughs> which is the site of toxicity for plain amphotericin. Actually, it's based on the site of infection, right, Dr. Neil? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. Yeah, Dr. Cherry. Yeah, it's. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I, okay. uh, thank you. I know from oh, this sort of, yeah. So, just to expand it a bit further, this kind of a targeting to a site uh, can be done some other ways also. So, uh, mm -hmm. here this is a, you know, even in Lishmana assays. The liver and the spleen are the main sites of infection. So they have those reticular endothelial cells. So they get taken up there. But one can target to the uh, cancer cells by putting the appropriate antibody onto the liposome. So they can get targeted to the tumor cells. Uh, that's one way of targeting the drug to any uh, you know site of where you want it to go, like in cancer. Ours was infection, so uh, we didn't have to put any antibody. But that's one way by which you can, uh, you know, I showed in that first slide different uh, ways by which you can target the drug to the site of your uh, site that you want to. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nilma. Is there any other question from the floor? So just to uh, further expand, you know, when there are multilamellar vesicles they get taken up rather quickly into the reticular endothelial. When they are they when they're made small, the small ones, they can circulate much more. So there is a much better chance of their going into the site of infection. So that's the advantage of converting the large one to smaller one by sonication. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, Professor Wawemoli asked, what is the best candidate of drug yeah, to form in the liposome. Oh, sorry, what is the? Yeah. Well, why, what is the question? Uh, so I think not all the drug can be uh, changed to the liposome uh, form, right? So uh, can you explain to us uh, what kind of, uh, I mean, the chemistry profile, chemistry profile of the drugs, then, then can be uh, changed the molecule to li liposome? So whether like lipophilicity or yes hydro something yes, like that yes, yes sure so, so a lipophilic uh, drug will get entrapped much more easily amphotericin is lipophilic so that gets entrapped easily and so we have nearly ninety five percent of the drug getting entrapped and uh, so you don't have to worry to remove the unentrapped drug because it's a very small quantity hardly five percent but if it's a water soluble drug uh, then that water soluble drug will get entrapped into the central cavity of it, you know, the central part, which is the water. Because, you know, when while making liposomes, what, what one does is that uh, you have the lipids and the drug maybe if it is lipid soluble, and that's all dissolved in methanol usually, and or any other so similar solvent. And then you rotate the rotary evaporator so that you get a formation of a film on the flask and then you add saline to it or dextrose to it and that's what forms the vesicle so the saline is entrapped inside the vesicle so if you have a water soluble drug then you dissolve it into that saline or dextrose and then when you add that that gets entrapped but then the amount that gets entrapped is much less compared to if it's a lipid soluble one and then you have to remove the uh, one which is uh, you know not dissolved so we had uh, sort of tried uh, these kind of techniques for drug like rapampicin, which is much more water soluble. But um, so we could do the entrapment and do all that, but it wasn't more effective than rapampicin as an anti-tubercular drug. So we did test that into TB the animal models, and we did all this, but then you know we didn't take that forward. So when you're developing something, there are some of the technologies, they don't go up to the market. I gave you the rosy picture of what went into the market, but you may fail in some uh, situation, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nilima. Yeah, and Dr. Nilima, have you used your uh, system in other drugs other than amphotericin? 
Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, we did that, tried that for a campesin. A campesin. And um, actually, we tried it also for iron. That, in fact, my ah. was interest was in trying to see if we can use iron in uh, liposome. Uh, because uh, intravenous iron, that time, especially what was available, would produce a lot of toxicity in patients. But um, we were not so successful in that. So these were some two, three others that we uh, tried then. and. Um, some uh, topical application, all that, these are being now, I think the company is developing the topical application uh, of uh, amphotericin skin application, but they're working on it yet. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any, yeah, any so, other question? Uh, so I address with the topical application yeah, of amphotericin. So it means uh, whether there is a special uh, preparation for uh, eye treatment, topical for eye. Yeah, uh, that's for... a good question. You know, the, you know there, are, there are a few people in other laboratories who are working on it and uh, to develop uh, preparation for eye application. But I, uh, they haven't yet done the studies to tell you whether they found it beneficial or not. You have to have the uh, appropriate animal model to be able to say whether it works on that. But it, it is something which is, uh, you know, uh, being being tried. I'm not sure whether there are any publications on it, but I know of some of the institutions which are trying liposomal amphotericin uh, on uh, eye infection, yes. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Muli. Is there any other questions? Yeah. So if there is no other questions, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Nilima Sirsargar for um, uh, informing us about the, the development of liposomal amphotericin in the field of uh, fungal infection. And then... Uh, I'm sure that her talk today will uh, open our uh, understanding on how we can develop this kind of uh, drug development. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, ac actually, there is one more question, Dr. Nilima. Yeah. Um, so, Dr. Nunik Cherry is asking whether the drug side effect on the kidney is less than the plain amphotericin? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. That's, uh, you know, if you look at plain amphotericin, uh, causes a lot of kidney toxicity. The creatinine increases, the glomerular filtration rate drops and so on. So it's a big problem. And especially patients who have had kidney transplant, it becomes even a bigger problem. You can't give them nephrotoxic drug. So liposomal amphotericin is a very big benefit for them because it uh, produces almost no nephrotoxicity, hardly any. So that is something which is very useful. I just want to add one thing. You know, I gave the example of the liposome production the way we do it. There are other methods of making liposomes and there are other methods of converting them into small vesicles also, like, you know, uh, what is called as French press. You know, you push it through small holes so they get converted to small. But what I showed is what we have done because that was practically something which was easy, possible, and we could uh, provide a technology which was, uh, you know, uh, easily doable and also at low cost. But there are other uh, technologies for making even liposomal amphibians. So you can uh, see that from the literature. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nilima. So, Dr. Cherry, I hope that answers your questions. And if there is no more questions, um, I would like to end this session. And then we would like to thank Dr. Nilima Sirsagar for um, sharing her uh, experience on, in developing amphotericin, uh, lip liposomal amphotericin. I would like to invite uh, Professor Wawai Muli Arozal to present uh, uh, electronic certificate for Dr. Nilima. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nilima.
So I hope uh, you can also uh, in the next future you can share your uh, different lecture to us. I will be happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, Every you day. let me know as and when you wish. I'll, yeah. I'll be very happy. And I can see that you have some very bright and uh, very good student. They have asked some very, very pertinent questions. So that, that's something very nice. And so thank you, the students, and also to both of you, Hawaii and Melva. Uh, it's a great experience for me. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiersagar. Thank you, Professor Hawaii.